As a boy, I usually celebrated Thanksgiving at my aunt and uncle's house. They lived on a farm in Richmond, Kentucky, which is just south of, of Lexington, if you're familiar with that area. And as a kid, it was certainly a, a time to look forward to. It's something I look forward to every year. Uh, one year, we, we rode ATVs all afternoon. Another year, we, we rode in a, or paddled rather in a canoe all afternoon, and one year we, we, we shot guns all afternoon. So as a boy, that it was just an adventurous time. It was something I, I really looked forward to. There was just so much land on this farm, so much to do that every year was just a new adventure with, with me and my, my cousins. But one year, and I think, I can't remember exactly, I think it was in seventh or eighth grade, something like that, I had battled with a, a severely... This is pretty gross, actually. Uh, ingrown toenail. Uh, gross. So my, my mom made the decision uh, to schedule everything so that I wouldn't miss any school to have surgery on that toe the day before Thanksgiving. And that meant that I had to take it easy uh, that Thanksgiving, which meant that I wasn't able to go run around and do all the fun stuff. So to a middle schooler, I was going to have a boring Thanksgiving, and I knew it. And let me tell you, I did. It was incredibly boring. I, I don't remember too much, but I do remember just sitting there watching like the Lions play someone, and that's always boring. Uh, but just sitting there with inside, stuck, stuck with all the old people, let's just be honest, for, as a middle school's perspective, uh, and so bored that I even took a nap. Uh, but looking back, that sounds like a wonderful Thanksgiving, so I wish I would be able to take advantage of that today. But like your typical middle school boy at the time, I was, was sulky, I was rude, and I was thank empty that year. But with Thanksgiving now behind us, the winter season, I guess, uh, just before us, the busiest time of year, so to say, has, has begun. And unfortunately for many of us, the holidays are, are looking different. Maybe this past Thursday felt a little different than in years past. It certainly did for me. Uh, none of us imagined this. None of us planned any of this. But we can't let this p uh, pandemic fatigue just drain us completely so that we're all just these sulky, rude people walking around. We can't do that. But this morning we can uh, conclude, we final finalized this series, uh, Thank Empty, and uh, over the course of this series, we've just been um, looking at, at Thanksgiving and being thankful. And, and leading up to Thanksgiving, we were, and, and looking back today, we were exploring these things like stress and anxiety and worry and all this, this trauma we've been exposed to and the way that we're, we're handling it emotionally and behaviorally. But through it all, we've tried our best to, to look at, at the situation and gain some sort of godly perspective and how to cope with, with, with 2020 and all the, the wonderful things, uh, that sarcasm, that has brought with it. But in a season that we're supposed to be thankful, we come to find that we're thank empty. But this morning, we're going to come to find that we should be thankful. Hopefully you, you had a great Thanksgiving. Hopefully you did. That was my prayer for all of you this, this past Thursday. And even though many of us uh, might have done things a little differently. Maybe it was a little bit smaller. Maybe you didn't travel around as much. Maybe you didn't have exciting plans for, for Black Friday, if that's your thing, for, for the next day. My prayer for you all was that you were less anxious than maybe you thought you would be, or less stressed than maybe you thought you would be heading into this, or less worried as you prepared for Thursday. The reason we've been exploring these, these issues of stress and anxiety and worry 
is because in doing so prior to, to this holiday that we already celebrated is because Thanksgiving gives us the perfect opportunity to transform our lives from those of, of maybe grumbling and those of dissatisfaction uh, to, to joy and to gratitude. Thanksgiving is a, is a wonderful holiday, a great holiday for us to maybe use that day as a turning point, to use that day to, to turn the corner on maybe how we acted prior to and become grateful people instead. No matter what we're going through, God wants us to be a people of thanksgiving. No matter what we're going through, a people of gratitude. A thankful spirit is really one of the key distinguishing marks of a Christian. A thankful spirit. It sets us apart from the world. It sets us apart from the culture. So as we turn to scripture here this morning with thanksgiving now in in the rear view mirror, you could say... I just want to take a look at, at why. At why, why be thankful? Why not stay thank empty? Why be thankful? What, what it, when it's so easy to be stressed and anxious and worried, when it's so easy to be sulky and, and rude and think empty, why be grateful? Why? Why be thankful? What are, what are even the benefits? Well, there are many ways that being grateful can benefit you if only for, your, for, if only for selfish reasons. Being grateful has benefits. As we've discussed through this Thank Empty series, staying in a, a, a heightened state of anxiety or persistent worry or, or constant stress, it can have damaging health effects on, on your body physically and mentally. So, What are then the benefits? What are the benefits of being thankful? Let's look. Number one, first, being a more thankful person can instantly increase your personal happiness. Most of us might think initially that our happiness is determined by our circumstances. Maybe if I ask you right now, on a scale of 1 to 10, how are you doing? On a scale of 1 to 10, how how thankful are you right now and happy are you right now about your circumstances? Maybe you're a 5. Maybe you're you're below. We've all been taught, maybe even uh, without being meant to be taught this way, it's just something that we've been accustomed to, that our happiness is, is determined or dependent on how things are going, on how, how life is treating you or other outside circumstances that are affecting your life. But happiness is actually a choice. It's a choice. Happiness is determined by the attitude that you want to have in the moment. Happiness is is how we essentially view the world around us. And happiness is determined, in, in other words, just by our perspective. We read this a few weeks ago, but let's read it again. The Apostle Paul wrote the following words from from prison. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul was rejoicing. And we dare say maybe Paul was even happy at certain points in prison. You might wonder how? Because he learned to thank God in all circumstances. He found portions of of his time in prison joyful because of finding the the thing that he could be thankful for in that moment. This was Paul's perspective on life and on on each and every day that was gifted him. Happiness and joyfulness is not determined by what's going on in our lives or the circumstances that that are being forced upon us, but rather our perspective in those moments, the the overall broad perspective of, of life in general. If we learn to be grateful, if we choose to be thankful, 
it's going to improve your attitude. It's going to improve your, your outlook on everything that you're doing. And it will improve your approach to each and every situation. Where you can look for that little glimmer of hope in even the darkest of circumstances. Secondly, being thankful. Number two, second, being thankful person can also instantly increase your witness for Christ. Having a noticeable thankfulness about you. Having that noticeable joy automatically makes you a better witness for Christ. I'm grieved every day by Christians out there who are mean-spirited. Maybe you know a few who are negative, who are just pessimistic all the time. That hurts your witness. It hurts the church. It really does. But when we are thankful and when we are just joyful, when the Spirit is, is, is outwardly flowing from us, hopeful people, we touch the world. We're an influence on someone who is watching, whether that's your neighbor, your friends, little ones in your house. We become a beacon of light in a dark and depressing and ungrateful world. Have you watched the news lately? I don't recommend it. Have you, have you looked at the world lately? Have you read some of the comment sections on social media? I don't recommend that either. People are hurting, though. Maybe you've heard that, that, that saying, hurt people, hurt people. A lot of that is, is, is cyclical, and it, we're seeing it on display. People are discouraged. People are wounded right now through all of this. And we don't need any more. We certainly don't need any more of that. Yet if we can learn and, and get into the habit of being different than that and, and being thankful and joyful and helpful, we will stand out immediately as a witness. And what is our motivation? In Christ. First Peter 2, 12 says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Mm. Living a life of thankfulness will influence those even those far from Christ. And that's pretty humbling to let that sink in. Number three, being a thankful person will also instantly increase your compassion. Your compassion. In my time in ministry, there is, is one thing that I notice very often about married couples who've been married for a while. After a while, they just kind of plateau and become, without even trying, ungrateful for each other, unappreciative of their spouses. Sure, if you ask them, they'll, they'll tell you that they are, but just the way they interact shows a level of ungratefulness, a level of unappreciation, and this is very common in counseling uh, couples who've been married for quite some time. Over, t over time, they just take each other for granted. The longer we become familiar with really anything, but in this situation, our, our, our spouses, the less outwardly thankful we, we are, maybe the less we, we say it, or the less we go the extra mile to, to show it. But if you're a husband, imagine how much your, your marriage maybe could improve if you just came home every once in a while with, with a small gift of appreciation. Or if not a gift, at least some words of appreciation. And just tell your, your wife how thankful you really are for all that she does and, and for who she is. And, and wives in the same way. Just think about how maybe much your marriage could improve if you told your husband how much you appreciated him in a similar way. 
And church, imagine how much better our church relationships can be if we just expressed more thanks for each other, if we dived a little deeper into each other's lives, if we opened up a little more in our lives and just expressed our gratitude for one another and, and really built each other up, that, that big church word, edification. We build each other up, encourage one another, strengthen one another, grow together in Christ. Attitude goes a very long way. Words, just simple words, go such a long way to someone who's not even expecting to receive them. Thankfulness goes a long way. Let us remember the Apostle Paul in the majority of his letters. Let's just run through a couple of them. To the church in Rome, he wrote, First, I thank my God for all of you. To the church in Corinth, I always thank God for you. To the church in Ephesus, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. The church in Philippi, I thank my God every time I remember you. The church in Colossae, I always thank God when I pray for you. Imagine if you heard, heard that on a regular basis. From your, from your husband, from your wife, from your friends, from your, your fellow church family. Paul made sure to let the people in his life know how thankful he was for them, just so that they knew on a regular basis, and they heard it often. Thankfulness increases our compassion for others, and the more we do it, maybe the more easy it gets. And if compassion is, is abound in a church like this, what a beautiful thing it would be. Fourth, being thankful will also instantly improve our relationship with God. And that's, that's important. That's the utmost of benefits. Colossians 3, 15 through 17. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And we like to, to take this verse and often just maybe verse 17 is like one of our life verses, whatever you do and word or deed. But Paul's talking about the church. Paul's talking about the way we interact with each other, not just an individual thing. This is a group thing. The more grateful we become, the more thankful we become, the more we find we need to give thanks. Wow, I am, I am so much more thankful because I'm thankful. The outpouring becomes just automatic. There becomes a desire within us to give thanks for every little blessing that we, we recognize in the moment. It compels us to prayer. It compels us to worship. When we give thanks to God, we naturally draw closer to him as we recognize that he is, is the provider now, it's easy for me to stand up here and just say, be more thankful. Be more thankful, people. Express your thanks more. Let's do that. Let, let's pray more. Let's worship more. Let's, let's read our Bibles more. That, that's very easy to do. But I realize it's not always easy, especially during difficult times, especially during things that are, are stressful or things that cause you worry or anxiety, especially when life is bearing down on you to just just go do, do all that. But how do we make this practical? How do we make this to something that we can actually grab hold of and, and, and practice in our lives? How do we become thankful people when, when we just don't feel like it? How do we become thankful people when we're thank empty? Well, it's, it's, it's plain and simple in concept, like many things are, but it's going to take some work. It's actually going to take some effort. And we don't necessarily flock to things that take a lot of effort. But let's do this. We have to change our behavior. And ultimately, we need to change our habits. 
We get in the habit of just doing the same thing all the time, the same way. We have to break that if we want to change. There's an old story told about a poor man who was given a loaf of bread, and he thanked the baker, and the baker said, don't thank me. I'm just the baker. Go thank the miller who milled the flour. So the guy went to the miller, and he thanked the miller, and the miller said, don't thank me. I'm just the miller. I just milled the flour. Go, go thank the farmer. He's the guy you need to thank. He planted. He planted the stuff. So the guy went to the farmer, and the farmer said, why are you thanking me? Don't thank me. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord because he gave us the sunshine. He gave us the rain. He gave fertility to the soil, and that's ultimately why you have this loaf of bread before you today. When we're in the, stuck in the habit of always expecting things to be before us or provided for us or just on the shelf at the store, we forget all the blessings behind all the things that we have. We forget the gift behind all the provisions so readily available before us. And that's one of the biggest telltale signs that we're stuck in this just heart of expectancy. And usually when we're stuck in expectancy, we're more likely to complain. I once heard a minister say, quote, I used to think people complained because they had a lot of problems, but I have come to realize that they have a lot of problems because they complain, end quote. Complaining doesn't make anything better. Complaining doesn't make your situation just all of a sudden better. Complaining makes it actually worse because it tears down your, your attitude. It tears down your morale. It just makes us miserable. And it clouds us to the other blessings that surround that which we are complaining about. Philippians 2, 14 through 16. Paul reminds us to do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in labor or, or in vain. Complaining is really the enemy of gratefulness. Complaining is the opposite of a thankful heart. The two really can't coexist together. You can't be thankful at the same time you're complaining. And so I challenge you and I, and I challenge myself as well to just stop. To just stop complaining. We're, we're almost coming up to a new month. So let's, let's challenge ourselves maybe here this morning for the whole month, for the, for the entirety of December. Don't complain about anything. It seems like a, a tough challenge, but maybe we need a tough challenge. When I feel tempted to complain, instead of, instead of uh, stating a complaint or saying a complaint out loud or even thinking a complaint, let's declare a word of praise instead. Can we do that? So in pursuit of thankfulness, we are changing our behavior, and that's one way to do it. In our pursuit of thankfulness, we are changing maybe a habit, and that's just one way to do it. And keeping the proper perspective and not complaining is, just, is a really big part of that. One more practical application, and this is, this is difficult. Every single day, we must be thankful. I'm not sure how you feel about this word, but we need, we need discipline. <laughs> Daily discipline of being thankful. We need to develop the discipline of daily giving thanks. Every single day. Certainly not once a year on Thanksgiving only. We need to discipline ourselves to find something each day that we are thankful for and thank God for that thing or whatever it might be. Maybe we need to create a journal to help organize our thoughts and write out just one thing per day and make that your, your, your daily 
thing of thanks that you're, you're thankful for. Just a, a file on your phone, a, a Word document on your computer, however you want to do it. List each day one thing that you can focus on to be thankful for. Somewhere, anywhere, list that thing and reflect on it and keep coming back to it all throughout that day. Some, maybe it's something God has done for you. Maybe it's something God has provided for you. Maybe it's something God has, has given to you or protected you from. It, it really shouldn't be that hard to list one thing a day, but I challenge you to do that. Whatever it is to help you remember, just put it into practice and do it. Daily discipline will prevent us from this, this, this state of thank emptiness. I'm sure many of you know the hymn, count your blessings. When you're, when you're doing this journal, when you're doing the, the Word document, that's essentially what you're doing. You're counting your blessings. Lyrics from the song, from the hymn, when upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. If you stick with this and you list out, maybe throughout the month of December, 31 different things you're, you're grateful for, you might be surprised when you turn back and reflect on, on such a list. And imagine if you stick with it for, for three months or six months or a full year. Imagine what that list would look like and how really surprised you would be and thankful you would naturally be. It's such a list. Gratefulness is a daily discipline. Thankfulness is a daily discipline. A professor that I had in, in college was bivocational. He was a professor and also a minister. And he told, he told us in class one day about this woman at his church named Lois. When Lois was really in the prime of her life, a young adult, she had a stroke and was confined to a wheelchair. She was very much still mentally alert, uh, but could not walk or do any other sort of normal activities for the remainder of her life. She lived in a care home, and the only time she was really able to leave was once a week to come to church. And that was the highlight of her week, the highlight of her life coming to church on Sunday mornings when someone from the church volunteered to go pick her up. One day my professor, like I said, the minister of, of that church, uh, was, was on the rotation to go pick her up from, from her home, and the professor told us it was really difficult sometimes to place her in the car. Uh, she wasn't really able to, to help herself into the car, and he drove such a compact car that it was difficult to kind of get her down into the seat um, but he wouldn't be able to do it by himself if it wasn't for this device that she had, a device they, they simply called her slide board, her slide board. What's a slide board, you ask? Well, it's just a piece of fiberglass. That's all it really was, a piece of fiberglass that, that fit, that was small enough to fit underneath her, her legs, underneath her thighs, and allowed her to just slide from her wheelchair into the car. It's nothing fancy. You can't really buy it in a store. You just go to Lowe's and, and cut it out yourself. But it's just an inexpensive piece of fiberglass. One day, Lois pulled uh, my professor, the minister, aside. He said, Aaron, do you know what I thank God for every single day? He's like, what's that? What's that, Lois? I'm thankful for my slide board. I'm thankful for my slide board because with it, I can come to church. Here you have Lois, a person who really has all the, the reason in the world to be angry, to be bitter, to be thank empty about the circumstances of her life. She has all the reason in the world to shake her fist at the trial she's been through, through the, the negative circumstances that she's living in, but instead she's thankful. She's thankful for this, this little blessing that to her is a huge blessing. To thank God for her simple fiberglass 
slide board. Lois has counted her blessings. Have you? As the worship team comes forward, let's close this morning with scripture. Psalm 118, 1 through 4, says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his love endures forever. And I can't think of anything to be more thankful for than the love of God, the everlasting love of God that endures forever. Something that you can be thankful for each and every day, whether you're anxious or stressed, or worried. Hang your life on the fact that God loves you forever. If this morning you've never accepted Christ, never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, being baptized for the forgiveness of sins, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, will you do that this morning and come forward as we all stand together?